JC Direct this week, Abenomics has worked Brent and Gold higher as Fed seems happy with higher inflation. Results from Remgro, Sabvest and Sun International. This is JC Direct 579 for 22 March. We're a day late because of the public holiday. My name is Simon Brown and this podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. Com. So let's kick off first. We've got a, a bunch of events. We've been talking about them. They are up. Things are happening. Uh, and uh, I suppose what's most important is uh, some details. So we've got one on the 18th of April. We've been talking. We've got our power hours back, brought to you by Standard Bank. We're starting with getting started in shares. And I know a bunch of you are... I know all about shares. I mean, fair point, absolutely, but there's some stuff there, and maybe we can learn. But also we're doing this webcast, as always. It will also be live at the head office in Baker Street, 30 Baker Street, which is Rosebank. Come along. It will be a great event. It will be huge amounts of fun. There is on-site parking if you need, and you can find all of this at justonelap.com slash events. Our second one is a week later, 23 April. That is at 11 a.m. We're teaming up with one invest who are ETF issuers locally and unit trusts, and we're looking at some of their ETF products. We're going to be focusing on the tech, U.S., offshore, Asia, and the like, particularly the ETF 5IT, which was the best performing ETF last year in South Africa. What is its constituent? What makes it the best tech and, truthfully, the purest tech ETF as well. Just one lap.com slash events, more information and booking details. So let's kick off with uh, Marcus Yuster news breaking overnight that uh, so earlier in the week he'd been fined what almost 500 million rand uh, news breaking late on Thursday uh, that he had uh, died by a gunshot wound to the head. I want to say a, a couple of things here. The first is, I, I, I don't think this is lacquer at all. There's a lot of folks who are saying good riddance. I disagree completely. Um, I think that we want to see justice done. And also, I just want to make the quick point around uh, uh, suicide. And, and folks, if you're thinking of uh, sort of self-harm, uh, speak to somebody, speak to friends, professionals. I know it's not easy, but it's important and you are important. And I don't think that this is a great sort of solution to the Steinhoff saga, which has been ongoing forever and a year. I think this is a, a messy end. And I would much rather have seen Marcus Huster get his day in court. But let's touch on uh, Telcom. So they have sold their towers business. Now, I've been chatting with the CEO for some time around this, and he's been saying, yeah, yeah, they're going to unlock some value. And the question is, well, when was this going to happen? Well, it's now officially happened. They announced, what's it, 6.75 billion rand for that. There's two important things about that number. Firstly, I think the market was looking for closer to five or five and a half billion. So it's a good number. Secondly, it's about half of their market cap. And that's a big deal. I mean, literally, they've now got half of their market cap in cash in the bank. What are they going to do with it? Uh, stock is responding well. I'm recording this Friday morning just after the open. We're up about seven and a quarter percent. Telcom is not a business that particularly thrills me, to be perfectly honest. It is, I mean, yes, it's, it's uh, uh, you've got the mobile division, it's got some nice business divisions in there as well. Uh, it had the SwiftNet, which is the towers, that is now gone. They were going to list it. I would have liked a listing on that, but, well, we didn't get it. It's just, you know, these telcos, all of them, MTN, Vodacom, Telcom, they have a problem, which is massive, massive CapEx spend. And that CapEx spend isn't going away, not anytime soon, just not going away. They need to constantly be rolling out. Currently, it's 5G. Uh, but before they finished on the 5G, they're going to start looking towards 6G. There's just that continual spend. And yes, we use more data, but they've got to charge less for it. You know, it, it it's, it's a utility, but it's a utility with massive ongoing CapEx and a price point that ultimately is heading towards zero. Not a great business to be in by any stretch of imagination. Uh, let's have a look at uh, some of the commodities. So what we had was Jerome Powell, and I'm going to talk around him in a moment or three. But before we get to Jerome Powell, uh, what we've got is oil really making a run for it. And truthfully, uh, this is a, a, a little bit spooky because, well, oil is, is an expense that none of us can particularly avoid. It's always going to be there. It's going to come into our petrol prices, and it's going to come into 
absolutely everything else. And we can see this oil chart where it was slowly edging up to that uh, first bit of resistance around the 86 odd level. It's hit it. It's a little bit lower today as I record, but certainly it looks like it's going to get to that second level of resistance, which is around about 93 up to around 97. And that's going to hurt. It's going to hurt our petrol price, so it hits us directly in the pocket. But then everything is pretty much moved. There is very little in the world that we buy at its source of where it is manufactured. Everything has to, goods get to the factory, what the production facility, they are made, and then those goods are moved to where we buy them. And the, the increase in petrol, it hurts. And it's going to hurt not just South Africa and South Africans, it's going to hurt the global economy at the same time, which is partly, I think, why perhaps we have seen uh, gold having a, a good day in the sun. As I said, I think gold is also uh, partly to do with uh, uh, what we're seeing from uh, Jerome Powell in his statement uh, on Wednesday evening. But gold continues to run, uh, traded at new all-time highs yesterday above 2,200. Come back a little bit today. Uh, let's have a look, see at how we're seeing the gold miners. Are they running? Uh, well, everything seems to be running. Gold miners uh, a little bit. Pan-African up 2.7. Gold fields up 2.25. DRD 2% and Anglo Gold is Shanty 1.5%. And, and Harmony isn't even popping up on my screens here simply because it's just not exciting enough in terms of the move. But we are having a massive day. Why is MTN up 6 and a bit and Vodacom up 2.1? That, I, I don't know. I, 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 I haven't seen anything around that. I don't think we have had any announcements out from MTN. Let's quickly call up their sense. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we do. Nope, nothing from MTN. I suppose they're just moving. You know what perhaps the deal is? MTN uh, sold off their towers to uh, IHS. They've got some stock in that. And now we get another valuation for towers that perhaps is higher than the markets had thought. And therefore, MTN is a winner in that space. But that oil is worrying me. That oil, certainly, we need to keep a very close. It's also... It's inflationary, right? It pushes inflation higher. It absolutely does. So let's quickly jump in to what Jerome Powell did say, which was no rate to decrease. We didn't expect a decrease from him. Although remember, back in January, the market was giving a 60 plus percent probability of rates coming down at the March meeting and there being six rate cuts over the course of the year. Well, that March meeting has happened. We didn't get the cut. And Jerome Powell is basically saying we're going to have three rate cuts this year. That's it. No six, forget six. We're going to have three rate cuts this year. And that has massive implications. It means we're going to end the year with U.S. rates maybe at 4.5% which is better than the current uh, 525 to 5.5, but it's uh, not by any stretch coming down fast. So higher rates, and we're seeing that in results already, the pain in terms of companies who have debt. The flip side is companies with cash. Go look at those JC results. You've got two plus billion of cash and cash equivalents while you're earning interest on it. Look at Apple, 150 billion plus of cash and you're earning interest on it. But if you've got debt, we're seeing those net interest bills increase. And whilst they're going to settle at some point, they're not going to come back down to what we saw in the previous decade, those pre-pandemic levels. We just not going to be seeing that anytime soon. It is expensive, and, and that debt is going to continue to be expensive. The short answer is careful of stocks that have a lot of debt. Are they able to generate significant cash flow to pay the current debt levels? Are they looking to reduce debt levels? Some of them are going to be saying, oh, the debt is fine. Is it really? What about stocks where debt levels are moving higher? How spooked should we be by those? Truthfully, I think probably a fair bit. This is the new reality for investors. This is not a passing trend like inflation maybe was, maybe is. This higher interest rates is the new reality. Yes, we'll probably get the Fed rate down to, I don't know, three, maybe three and a half, uh, probably closer to three and a half, maybe only 4%. That is a lot higher than what we were seeing pre-pandemic where one, one and a half was the norm and it points even lower than that. If we look local, we had CPI data out on Friday. It was disappointing. Make no mistake. Not on Friday. What am I saying? Came out Wednesday. It was disappointing. Make absolutely no mistake about that. It was worse than expected. I think the key thing 
However, we need to understand where that uh, increase came from. And it mostly came from insurance. And that's another issue we've seen. I, mean, I think famous brands said their insurance costs were up over 400%. So we got inflation at 5.6%. Uh, Previous had been 53 Expected was 55 So it was not a fun number by any stretch of imagination. We now have the uh, Reserve Bank MPC meeting Thursday coming up. And the question is, are we going to see a rate cut? No, we're not. Uh, we're not going to see a rate cut, just not going to happen. There's our CPI. We want between three and six, although the governor will tell you quite clearly that he actually wants four and a half. So most of the increase, in fact, all of the increase that we saw for February was insurance. But now if you throw that oil price higher, are we going to get this to four and a half percent anytime soon? And perhaps more importantly, uh, when do we see some cuts? Consensus for South Africa seems to be converging around about a 0.75 to 1% of rate cuts for the year, starting around the middle of the year. Okay, that's lacquer, but it's not coming down fast. And the risk here, and it's the same everywhere else, is that inflation doesn't get lower. Powell seemed to say he's not so stressed anymore. He's going to give the three rate cuts. He almost moved away from being data dependent. He's been saying, we will watch the data. But he seemed to kind of suggest, well, do we need to? Maybe we don't. Maybe we can take a little bit of higher inflation, which is why gold suddenly went absolutely crazy and why we're seeing the, the reality, which is that higher inflation and rates is here to stay. Now, inflation might trend down. But it's, again, it's not going to go, we're not going to suddenly get local inflation at 4% and DM inflation, developed market inflation, sub 2%, which is the numbers that folks are looking for. That's not going to suddenly be happening. So we've got gold running. We've got gold running massively as a result of that, uh, trading up over 2,200 on Thursday, back a little bit more today. And I think this is going to be the theme. I've been talking about it a bunch, that inflation is proving sticky. I think we can 75 points, 100 point cut this year from the MPC is, I think, best case. There are risks that we get less. There are risks that we get none. And I think even from the Federal Reserve, they're talking around cutting perhaps as soon as the next meeting. But that's not because inflation is where they want it. It's because they're almost, in a sense, saying, you know what, inflation, perhaps not as worrisome as everybody thought. And I got to say, I, uh, I, I disagree with that. I mean, inflation is worrisome. I think we should be uh, working to uh, beat inflation. I don't think we should just say, ah, how about some inflation? Don't worry, everything will be gnarly. Uh, no, everything is not necessarily gnarly at all. Let's have a look at some results. We had uh, Sun International came out with results, uh, a really, really strong set of numbers. Let's be clear, uh, they have uh, HEPs up 88.1%. That is a massive jump. And what did the stock do? It moved lower. Uh, let's get this to a weekly chart, which is my preferred, and let's take it out a whole bunch more to five years. Uh, what we can see is that it was kind of getting a little bit squeezy up there. And the Sun International chart is looking poor. Why didn't the market love 88% increase? They were expecting it. It's partly base effect. But the question then comes in, where do they get further growth from? South African consumer under pressure? Mm, not so sure. Foreign tourists? Yes. We're not yet back at pre-pandemic levels, but we are close enough to those pre-pandemic levels. We can probably get there. It's a couple of thousand tourists or so, and we're at pre-pandemic. But where are we going to get significant further growth from tourists? Where are we going to get 10% growth a year? What are we as a country, as a tourism, as a department out there doing to get the foreign tourists coming in. We were going to sponsor some football team for, was it a billion rand or something crazy? I don't know if that was good, bad or ugly, but it's out the window. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. We need to get tourists coming and we're getting growth. But let's be clear, we're not getting thrilling growth. So we've seen, I think, great numbers, but I think the future growth coming out is going to be hard. We spoke about City Lodge when they did their... Uh, results more recently. Again, great numbers and again, stocks sold off. They, their challenges, their margins are getting a little bit squeezed on the rooms. Now, once they start to get to a level of occupancy of around 65, 67%, what you see then is you start to get that pricing power. 
But what are they going to have to do to get that extra 4 or 5% occupancy? And that is what the markets are worrying about in terms of these uh, leisure stocks. So, yeah, we have had really, really great numbers from them. But uh, thanks, no thanks. Then we had REM grow results. And i got to say, I've long been, uh, I suppose the word I should say is, fascinated by REM grow and the discount that we see on the REM grow share price. This is a stock that is currently trading at a discount of around 50% to its net asset value. It used to trade at around uh, 15 or 20%. Now it is 50%. The market hated on the numbers. And I think perhaps there's a bigger story out here. So Pete Flynn was uh, posting it on his Twitter account, uh, and I will quote him. Rengro has grown its net asset value per share by 5% a year since 2010. Over the same period, the all share total return index, i.e. including dividends, has done 12%. So the thing is, is that why do you buy Remgro? Partly for the assets, but also partly for the asset allocation by the directors. If they're only doing 5% a year, well, heck, that's not, you, you, you frankly got to say, are they any good at what they're doing? And that really then becomes the question. And the answer seems to be no. So maybe that 50% discount is justified if you think that management is just perhaps not up to the job. And if you look at Sabvest, it's grown its NAV at twice the rate of the all share over the last 13 years. And hence, we've got Sabcap, which is doing markedly better because it's doing what it says on the, on the sticker, which is, well, we're going to use our investment skills to give you superior return. That's what markets want. They don't just want, you know, boring old normal return. They need superior return. So Sabvest Capital, uh, although it is off the highs, has done markedly better. Now, there's some risk here, uh, as Chris Seabook has been doing a lot of sort of new deals and the like. And the question then is, how much does that fundamentally change the picture? And the point is, it might a fair bit. But we've got two capital allocators here, Remgro done incredibly poorly, and uh, Sabvest done incredibly well. For the market, it's an easy decision. Sabvest, of course, still trading at a discount to net asset value, even though we are seeing uh, quite significant uh, NAV uplift in that environment, still trading at a much lower level. So Abenomics, this was the Japanese plan. And if, let's go back some 25-odd years to the late 90s where Japan started experiencing uh, negative GDP growth. Their inflation was stuck uh, around zero at times into negative. They were absolutely in a hole. Around 17 years ago was the last time that they had raised rates and they had uh, taken them to zero, left them forever. Around 2016, 17, they actually took rates to minus 1.1%. Uh, so not massive negative, but negative. And the Bank of Japan just this week now raised it to zero. So first time they've raised rates in 17 years and the first time in some seven or eight years that they've actually had rates that are now actually no longer negative. The key point here is what was the story? As I said, they were sitting in no GDP, uh, very, very low inflation, at times deflation, the problem with deflation, sure, you're going to go and buy your groceries because you need to eat. But that white appliance, that car, that big purchase you're going to do, well, you wait a time, right? Because you wait a year because it's going to be cheaper in a year's time. So people stop spending, and what that does, your GDP collapses. So they take rates to zero, and ultimately they take rates to negative. What does that do? Well, that encourages spending. Suddenly, it's not that the item you want to buy is going to be cheaper. It's that if you, st if you save money, you put 100 yen in, in a year's time, you're going to get, well, 99.1 yen back. So you're actually going backwards in that regard. So there's no saving. You can borrow at essentially you're not going to get the minus 0 0.1, but you're going to borrow at probably 0 0.1 positive. So you're out there and suddenly you get the Japanese economy starting to spend. Of course, it wasn't so much about suddenly, it was still a fairly slow process, but it was happening and it has happened. And what we've essentially now seen, I think we can say Abenomics has worked. And what I mean by worked is that we've got Japanese inflation above 2%. We've got GDP going again. So the forcing of people out there into the spending world has sort of got that GDP up and happening, has got inflation, and is seeing an economy doing significantly better. It's, it's, it's wild. It's kind of been a 
20 plus year experiment. In fact, we could say this is even longer. We can take this back to the 80s and call it a, what, a 40 year experiment. Remember, the Nikkei 225 peaked in December, what, 1989, and then only just last month, February, did it recover that 39,000 odd level and is trading above 40,000. It's been 40 years of watching an economy stutter and stumble and then slowly get repaired. And we've kind of watched it in real time. But the fascinating thing is now we sit at the end of it and we can say, hey, I think it's worked. And and it took a long time. And for the first mm, 20 years, nothing they tried did work. They tried all sorts of things. And it was just, you know, disaster after disaster. But finally, they've got it to a point where it has worked. And I think that is a... I think it's an amazing story, and I think we can uh, tell folks in decades to come. We were there. We watched the Japanese economy. And if another economy falls into this type of environment, we perhaps have some answers, which perhaps is even the bigger deal in a sense. I'm going to leave it there. Remember, we've got events uh, 18 and 23 April, justonelap.com slash events. You can go and book there. If you are in the, in the Greater Joburg Rosebank area uh, for 18 April, come along to Center Bank. It's going to be fun. As I said, these power hours were as much around uh, great speakers and the like. They were also social events, and I think that might be the more important part in all of it. But we'll leave it there for this week. My name is Simon Brown. We'll get back to our normal production next week because the public holidays are now moving to the weekend. As always, look after yourself, and if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers, all. Cheers.